Hello, my name is Andrea Miles, and on behalf of the Stennis Center for Public Service, it is my pleasure to welcome you to our video series on congressional debate. The Stennis Center is a bipartisan legislative branch agency created by Congress in 1988 to promote and strengthen the highest ideals of public service in America. The mission of the Stennis Center is to attract young people to careers in public service, provide training and development opportunities for senior congressional staff members of Congress and other public service leaders across the United States. The Stennis Center supports congressional debate because it develops an awareness of the challenges and rewards of public service as students build skills that may someday be applied in a public service career and learn tools to help them participate in civic engagement activities in their communities. In today's video, you'll learn how to write your own legislation, enabling you to propose solutions to problems that matter to you. Use this new skill to succeed not only in congressional debate, but to analyze and critique actual legislation and even propose your own. We hope this video series provides you an opportunity to learn more about congressional debate and become a successful participant in Student Congress and beyond. For more information on the Stennis Center and congressional debate, please visit our website, www.stennis.gov. Hey everybody, I'm Brett Harvey, the coach of the Mississippi State University debate team. And I'm Mia Robertson, Speech and Debate Program Assistant at the Stennis Center for Public Service. We want to welcome you to our third video in the Stennis Center for Public Service's Congressional Debate Boot Camp, where we'll be talking about writing legislation. The key to having a fun educational debate round is good legislation, and most commonly, the tournaments rely on the students to present that legislation. Drafting legislation is just as important as the debating or the parliamentary procedure or any other part of Student Congress. It's where you get to become an expert on something. And rather than just accepting or rejecting the solution that other people, you know, out in the quote unquote real world have come up with, this is the one form of debate where you really get complete freedom to propose your own solution to it and to think about the ways in which you would solve the problem. And so that's why in this video, we're going to focus on some tips for writing strong, debatable legislation. So the first step to writing a good piece of legislation is understanding what good legislation actually means and what that looks like. And there are basically two schools of thought on this. Many people think a good bill or resolution is exactly what a bill in the ordinary U.S. Congress would look like, and that is something that actually clearly benefits the real world or society in some tangible way. And the more obviously good it is, the more urgent it is, the fewer arguments against it, the better. Uh, but remember, we're not in the real world. We're debating in a student congress debate round. And in this world, we're not learning to save the real world. We're advocating for positions. We're learning how to work together, how to debate, how to lead. And often, to make that simulation, uh, we don't need ideas that are simply unambiguously good ideas with absolutely no arguments against them. We need good ideas that are also slightly controversial. Right. And that's how we have a debatable good debate round. In other words, bills and resolution where there is room to debate on both sides. Put simply, a bill where there's literally no argument against it might be great in the United States Congress but it wouldn't be very good for student Congress because, again, there's really nothing to debate. And this is important not just for, for the good of the Congress overall, but it's important for you, right? If you want to see your legislation get on the docket, it has to be something where your colleagues in the chamber look at it and say, yeah, that would be something we could debate. There would be something that people on both sides would be able to disagree with and we could get widely varying perspectives. So for example, uh, if you had a piece of legislation that imposes sanctions on some small country with a terrible human rights record like North Korea, well, that might be a no brainer in the real world, right? Because North Korea's human rights record is objectively terrible. It doesn't <laughs> offer the United States anything economically. So why not sanction them, right? But precisely 
precisely because it is so inarguable, right, it would probably make a relatively poor piece of legislation in student congress. A better choice in congressional debate or student congress, whatever you refer to it as, might be a bill to sanction a country that has a more nuanced human rights record, one that's still arguably pretty bad, but not quite as bad, and maybe a country that offers the United States more economically. So maybe a country like Egypt or the United Arab Emirates or something like that, that would be a more controversial piece of legislation and it would be more viable in terms of actually getting on the docket and getting debated. And of course there are many ways to write a controversial and debatable piece of legislation but the most obvious is to write a bill that um, works along party lines that would create party divides. So something like immigration, fossil fuels, energy policy, or right now you could write something about defunding the police or forgiving student loans. Of course these arguments are going to be controversial, they're going to be debatable. Another common potential downside for legislation if you're looking to make it controversial, which you should be, uh, is cost. Right. So, for example, proposals to address the problem of climate change, like the Green New Deal, come with a massive price tag. They could now arguably have equally massive benefits, though, right? Uh, universal child care, something like that, is a very popular idea, but it would cost hundreds of billions of dollars, according to most estimates. Uh, and, you know, as we've said in previous videos, the United States already is running massive deficits, has a large public debt, and so these issues of cost are important. Another way cost can be framed as cost to individuals and cost to consumers. So again, if we come back to an example we've looked at in this series, a bill to raise the federal minimum wage to $15 an hour, well, there is an argument that that would raise costs for consumers. Increasing uh, a tax on gasoline would increase the cost on consumers, and many folks couldn't afford that easily. So there are different ways that cost can factor in as a downside, and it's a, it's a fair way to have debatable ground on both sides of a piece of legislation. There also may be collateral consequences from any particular piece of legislation. Imagine you have a resolution condemning a country for human rights violations. Now, of course, nobody's in favor of violating human rights, but there might be an argument that passing that piece of legislation could damage the United States' relationship with our allies. Or imagine a piece of legislation for defunding the police or um, restructuring police departments to have fewer police officers and more workers trained in things like um, counseling and conflict resolution. Now that may have collateral, collateral consequences, though it might sound good, for um, high crime areas or for officers to investigate major crimes. And that in turn um, leads businesses to leave the area and that hurts local jobs and um, tax collection, for example. So there's plenty of different ways that you can argue about whether a piece of legislation is beneficial, but still leave room for debate on both sides of the issue, right? So as you begin the process of drafting legislation, it is really important to brainstorm and ask yourself, what are the basic arguments on the other side? Now this is important not just to getting on the docket, but it's really a big part of the educational benefit of congressional debate, learning the pluses and minuses, the upsides and the downsides of legislation. In some cases, you might be able to change the draft up and mitigate it. In some cases, you might want to leave it in to ensure that there is ground on both sides of the legislation to debate. The second thing to remember about writing legislation, and this is true for any event in speech and debate, that is that you need to be keeping up with current events, um, public policy generally. Um, it's great to research one particular issue that's coming up in a bill. Of course, that's great and that's very important. But to develop a knowledge base that will actually prepare you to be successful, to answer questions in cross-examination, for example, you have to actually have a solid foundation and a solid understanding of the cultural climate around you. Um, the more you learn about politics and policy, um, economics and international issues, the more tools you have in your arsenal to make analogies, for example, and uh, to draw comparisons, to provide context. Exactly. That's true in the actual debating. It makes you a better debater. In terms of the writing of the legislation, the reason why reading is important is because it just gives you a bigger universe of things to pick from, right? If all you do is occasionally skim the headlines or, you know, hear things on an occasional podcast or on the news, right, the universe of topics that you know about to draw from is going to be extremely limited, right? And now look, I get it. I understand. It's hard to make a habit of reading the news on a regular basis if it's something you haven't done before. I get it. But if you want to be good at speech and debate generally, and, certain and certainly if you want to be good at student congress, it's just something you have to make part of, a part of your daily routine. It doesn't have to be something you spend hours on, but it does have to become a part of what you do every day. And it's going to make you better at 
everything from your academics to every event and speech and debate, certainly to student congress. And so that's why we're going to include a, a bunch of links to good sites that are like content aggregators that have news stories brought together in one location that can help you get started just following the news and following the headlines a little bit every single day. Sure. Uh, third, and this is a little bit more of a technical point, make sure that your bill or legislation is actually consistent with the level of government the Congress is role playing. Your chamber likely won't explicitly state we are role playing as the United States House of Representatives. Right. They may not explicitly say that, but the normal baseline assumption is that your chamber is acting as a national legislature for the United States. Right. There's nothing in the National Speech and Debate Association or NASDA rules that specifically says you are playing as the United States. United States Congress, but generally the assumption is that you are not going to see legislation that is specific to a particular state or city or local area. And the reason for that is that legislation would tend, first of all, to favor competitors from that area, right? So if you're a team from Wisconsin and you go to a national tournament and bring a bill that's really specific to Wisconsin, well, people from California or Mississippi are not going to be as well versed in that, right? So generally speaking, you're going to want to stay away from state and local issues unless maybe you can frame them in a broader national context. Like, for example, if your city is debating whether to defund or restructure the police, certainly you could write a bill about how that might be done or a resolution about how that might be encouraged on a national level. And that actually raises a really interesting point about exactly what the U.S. Congress can do, right? right? If you're in a student Congress and it's assumed that you're role playing as the national legislature of the United States, it's very important that you know what Congress can actually do. Now, of course, those rules are set out by the U.S. Constitution. And while those rules are very vague um, and broad as a practical matter, they are absolutely not endless. We don't have the time to go through all of Congress's powers in these videos, but we can leave some links down below about what exactly that might look like. As a practical matter, one reason why you want to make sure that your legislation falls within appropriate congressional power is because if you don't, uh, it's going to be open to attack on the grounds that it is unconstitutional or otherwise just beyond the scope of Congress's power. For example, if you write a bill on the topic we mentioned just a second ago, like for example, defunding or restructuring the police, well, one strong argument uh, against that would be as the con, right, that this is something that is not something a national legislature can do. It is something that falls within the power of local governments or state governments at the absolute most, but not something that a federal or national Congress would do. Now, the good news for purposes of drafting legislation is that as it turns out, Congress, the national legislature, actually does have really broad policy-making powers. So you do have a lot of options, right? The Commerce Clause in Article I of the Constitution gives Congress very, very extensive powers to regulate almost anything that touches on commerce between the states. And the way the courts have interpreted that is that pretty much everything that moves between the states or any interaction between the states, really almost anything, can constitute interstate commerce. So Congress has the power to regulate just about anything. And because of that, what we see is that Congress has used this commerce power to pass everything from the Civil Rights Act to the Federal Mine Safety and Health Act to the Controlled Substances Act, right? So there is a very good chance that the Commerce Clause will provide a grounds for you to write a bill, but you just need to be aware of the, the fact that that clause exists and that it is not unlimited. And even if the Commerce Clause doesn't apply, you still have some options. One thing you could consider is conditioning the receipt of federal funds on a state following certain rules. And, and we do this all the time in the real world. So uh, for example, this happens with things like education and um, highway safety rules to get federal money in these areas, you have to follow specific rules about structuring education or highway safety, for example. So you might think about using federal funding kind of as the mechanism for starting something in states or localities. But the bottom line is just give some thought as to where exactly a Congress would get the power right to address this issue. And if you are a national Congress or if you're pretending to be a national Congress, where would the federal Congress get the power to do this? Give that some thought, which actually uh, sort of leads to uh, another final general point about legislation, which is the difference between bills on the one hand and resolutions on the other hand. If, if you'll remember from our first video, we talked about the differences between bills and resolutions. Remember, bills are concrete policy actions and resolutions are merely a statement of belief 
belief by the chamber. So what that means is if there is a topic that is just too complex for you to address in a bill, you can always consider drafting a resolution to address that problem. Um, looking back at the example we mentioned earlier about it defunding the police, while the federal government may not have the authority to tell states and localities they have to defund their police departments, they could pass a resolution expressing a statement of belief that it would be preferable if states and localities did defund their police departments, for example. Yeah, I mean, let's face it. I mean, not every major world problem can be solved in a one or two <laughs> page piece of legislation yeah. in student Congress, which is the normal length of bills that you see. Um, you cannot realistically overhaul the entire United States Environmental Protection Agency or the Department of Defense in one page. But you can express a general belief that something should change, it should change in the following general way, and we should maybe begin investigating how this should happen, right? This is something the United States Congress does all the time. Resolutions, therefore, are an important tool that allow student congresses, congressional debaters, to address issues that realistically cannot be comprehensively addressed in a one or two page piece of legislation, and they're really important, and you should not consider them a second class piece of legislation. They're very, very important and useful. So now that you have these basic tips out of the way, we're going to go over how you can actually put pen to paper, actually get those ideas onto a piece of paper and have your bill or resolution. So the format of a bill is different from a resolution, so we're going to go over both. But as always, the NSDA has an incredible explanation of exactly how you do this. And they have several examples that we're going to link um, down below that you should absolutely check out. So let's get started with an example of a bill, a proposal to actually implement a specific policy. So the first thing you're going to need is a title. Uh, the most common titles for bills are literal. They are typically a bill to, and then you just list whatever the bill does. So a bill to raise the minimum wage to $15 an hour or whatever, right? A bill to withdraw military support from a certain nation, right? Under the title, the first line of the bill is always the same, be it enacted by this Congress that, and then you state what the bill does. Uh, and then after that, that's where you're going to start dividing up the text of the bill into different parts and different sections. Now, there is no one specific way to organize your sections, but there are certain basic things you're going to want to do in every single bill, and we're going to cover those topics really quickly in this video. Usually the first section is going to tell you exactly what the bill does. The second will usually define some ambiguous terms. A later section might address what agency is going to be overseeing the implementation of this policy. Um, and the last two sections usually give the date of implementation and also state that any conflicting laws are um, thereby null and void. You don't have to spell out all of the details of any particular piece of legislation, but you do have to answer some very basic questions. First, what is going to be done? What do the ambiguous terms mean? How much is it going to cost? And uh, how do we get that money? Who will oversee it if it requires oversight? And when will it take effect? So, you know, you might have five sections or six or seven. It really just depends on the bill, however many it takes to get the job done. Uh, but it's important that you spend some time researching the details of how this problem can realistically be solved in the real world so that you can paint a credible, you know, adult sounding like realistic picture of how the problem is going to get solved. So, for example, if a bill requires funding, you need to have an understanding from your research of about how much it's going to cost, right? Uh, so that you can identify a realistic funding source. A bill that costs a billion dollars is going to be a fundamentally different thing than a bill that costs a million dollars. I realize it's easy to sort of see those numbers run together <laughs> when you watch the news, but you're going to have to have a fundamentally large larger source of funding by an order of magnitude if something costs that much more. You're also going to want to make sure that you have a realistic understanding of what kind of agency or which agency right, is going to implement the bill. Uh, a lot of student Congress legislation, frankly, that I have seen over the years seems to just kind of sort of pick a, an almost sometimes random federal agency and assign a particular piece of legislation to it. I have seen, for example, bills that uh, assign reforming prison sentences to the administrative office of the U.S. courts. Well, I don't know if you know, but the administrative office of the U.S. courts is in charge of like assigning office space to judges and like paying <laughs> law clerks. They do not set sentences, right? So you're going to want to make sure that you understand what agencies actually do, how much things actually cost. So this will seem like a realistic, sophisticated, mature attempt to solve the problem, not just something, frankly, that a, you know, that a kid just churned out and didn't put much effort into. <laughs> 
In terms of length, most bills are going to be limited to one page, sometimes two, but it's best to keep your bills to one page um, at most competitions. And we would strongly recommend that you let a coach, maybe a government teacher, if you have people on your team that are experienced in Congress, let them look over your legislation for you, point out counter, counter arguments, um, tweaks, things that are missing because obviously you're going to need some feedback from other people and one of the most common criticisms of student congress legislation is that it's just far too vague. It doesn't explain terms that are ambiguous, it doesn't actually tell you exactly what is happening, where money is coming from, etc. So if your first draft isn't clear on that, getting some feedback allows you to revise that and make a clear second draft. And, and look, if there's a major defect in that first draft, uh, maybe you go back and fix it, right? So for example, if you take that uh, 15 dollar an hour minimum wage bill to a government teacher or a coach and they say well you know this is going to mean that certain tipped employees uh, are going to get a huge huge amount of money and that prices at restaurants are going to go up well you might decide to go back and put in an exception for tipped employees or you might not like we said earlier you might decide to leave that in to have debatable ground on both sides absolutely good good writing is rewriting right. one of Brett's favorite phrases. So <laughs> you almost always will be able to tighten up another draft based on constructive criticism that you received on your first draft. Okay, so let's shift gears now and talk about uh, resolutions. A lot of the same general principles apply, but there are some very significant differences, right? So when we're writing a resolution, which is a statement of sentiment, a statement of ideas, as opposed to a specific policy proposal, uh, we're going to have a fundamentally different format, right? So whereas bills have sections outlining the specific uh, parts, resolutions have what we call whereas clauses, which state the various justifications and reasons and details of exactly what we are resolving, right? So whereas, no pun intended, a bill is going to try to be very matter of fact and objective, right? Very, very factual and straight down the middle. A resolution is clearly partisan. It is making the argument for itself right there in the resolution, right? So now these whereas clauses can cover a lot of different ground, but some of the most common things that they do are they explain the problem, right? They describe the harmful effects that come from the problem, and then they explain how the basic idea in the resolution is going to begin to solve the problem. So just for example, here's a resolution to end coal mining. And as you can tell, it's pretty short and sweet. Most people are generally aware that coal mining has environmental harms, so there's absolutely no reason for you to spell all of that out in your resolution. Now here's another example, a resolution adopting a no first use policy that would prevent the U.S. from engaging in a first strike with a nuclear weapon. And as you can see here, no first use is far more esoteric. Not everybody knows what that means. So you're definitely expected to use the whereas clauses to briefly explain what that is and to give some background on um, what that is to people who may be unfamiliar. And once you've finished with the whereas clauses, it's really simple. You go ahead and actually state the resolution. It's usually one, one section. And it says, now therefore be it resolved, and you state whatever it is that you are resolving. And here again, resolutions, even more than bills, I would argue, really should never be more than one page. One of the big advantages they have is they don't have to be super detailed, so there's really never a good reason to have a resolution that runs more than one page. And there you have it. Those are the basics of drafting legislation. Again, we would strongly recommend that anyone participating in Student Congress write and draft your own legislation. It just teaches you such incredible skills, um, gets your feet wet in exactly what a congressional leader might be doing and what that looks like. And it also just helps you deeply familiarize yourself with a policy issue. Even if it doesn't get on the docket every single time, the process of researching and writing this legislation is going to give you such invaluable skills that you really can't get anywhere else. As it turns out, those skills are going to be applied really well in the next video we have, which is the one that many people have all been waiting for, which is actually getting up and debating legislation. So we will see you back here next time for that one.